Thank you for joining us today on Body Ecology Living with me, Donna Gates. Our show today is with a really special doctor. You'll see that very quickly. He's just released a brand new book called The Gut Balance Revolution. Dr. Gerald Mullen is a leading gastroenterologist, so he's very well qualified for writing this book. He's also an educator and a nutritionist. He's an associate professor of medicine at John Hopkins University. And, there, and when he's there, he's, he's directing the Integrative GI Nutrition Services. So he's a gut microbiome authority, and that's why we had to have him on the podcast. He happens to live in Baltimore, and I can't wait for us to get into some many questions I have here for him. So welcome, Dr. Mullen. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today, Donna. Well, I was so excited when I learned you were writing this book, and we first met at a conference on the gut in Florida a couple of years ago, and I was so honored, really, because you happened to mention fermented foods, and you mentioned my name or something, and you said you didn't even know I was in the audience there, but um, I, I was just, I couldn't believe it, like a doctor who has your training and background and experience and all actually knowing who I was, so thank you for that, but... Then, now you've got this book, and, and then I started reading the book, and I thought what I love about this book is it's so easy to read. And then you use terms like inner ecosystem, because, you know, when you say microbiome, it kind of, it's a little scientific for people to get emotionally attached to. So I thank you for writing the book, first of all. And then why? Why did you write this book? You know, the, it's very interesting to, to think about the, the journey of this book. <clears throat> the journey of this book began several years ago with another book that I wrote called The Inside Tract. And it was really meant to be a, a gut guide, uh, but it was, in the essence, it's about functional medicine. And, you know, what we're looking at now is really a renaissance of the gut. I talk about the terms revolution because it's very revolutionary concepts and, and a number of us for, for decades who are working in the gut and talking about the connections to bodily health were regarded as rebels um, and, yeah, revolutionaries and so on and so forth. But if you look back at the history to Ayurvedic medicine for thousands of years, that traditional healers have looked at the gut as a critical cog in controlling our health and, in fact, in Ayurvedic medicine, that breakdowns in GI physiology and dysfunction are the beginnings of bodily disease and treatment begins in the gut. So we have the, the likes of Eli Mechnikov, Hippocrates have made the, such comments that the, the gut is really the center of, our, um, center of our core being physiology, so on and so forth, that what we, you and I talk about on the phone today um, and at these conferences that uh, we, we were talking about just a few minutes ago are really, really a rebirth of something that's been out there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And yes, functional medicine and naturopathic medicine and, and certainly your work um, have kind of brought that to the forefront in practice. But the science has exploded in the last five years such that what you and I have been talking about for years has been regarded as, as I mentioned, maybe a little bit revolutionary or avant-garde, but it's really in sync with the, the science. The science has validated the fact that the gut microbiome or those billions of tiny microbes, if not trillions, really help control and regulate our health. And certainly, if we want to have better health, we better treat them much better than we have over over the past 20 years. Um, and we could certainly talk about what we've done wrong in, in treating them so badly. Well, I think part of the problem is we can't see the bacteria. You know, first of all, they're inside of us. And secondly, they're tiny. So I think that's somehow how we've missed them. I, I used to wonder that for 20 years. I've wondered how come something so important has escaped the attention of uh, the whole med science in the medical field, so and, and most of all, people, because the real world of people out there never have this information. Well, what I love about your book is you, you do have a lot of science in there, but it's explained so simply. And I would read things, which I, I already 
obviously know uh, this already and like I know about short chain fatty acids, but I love the way you explained them to people because as you're reading the book, it's like light bulbs are going off right and left. So I, I have a very sophisticated audience there. They know a lot about gut health because they've been following me for a while. So I'd like to go into some of the, some, some interesting topics. But you know, the other thing too is I loved the first page of the book. It was like shocking. You know, you tell about this little boy who goes into the doctor's office. The doctor's really kind of cruel and cold and typical, you know, People would definitely relate to that kind of doctor. Could you just tell a little bit about that story why you put it at the beginning of the book? Well, you know, the beginning of this book um, is interesting. It, it's such that uh, when I was about 17 years old and I had uh, mononucleosis, first thought to be strep throat, uh, but turned out to be mononucleosis. And I guess what happened was I, I was having, you know, quite a sore throat and fatigue from that. My mother brought me to the doctor who, uh, you know, diagnosed it with a very simple spot test. But, you know, she was also concerned that I was not really eating the sore throat, the Italian mother, you know, <laughs> you're not eating, there's something fundamentally wrong with you. Um, and at that point, I think I, I, I began to lose some weight at that point because of that. And so the doctor, you know, she made the comment about, well, oh, he's not eating. And, you know, he gave her a look like she was like from Mars. and said, uh, it, you know, well, it, it may make a healthy dent, uh, a real negative condescending comment and looked at her uh, quite dis- you know, dismissively and, and, and left the room. So I had the unfortunate, uh, um, you know, uh, interaction with him one more time. You know, I have seen him follow up. Um, this time she really didn't want to come in and you can't blame her. And so I saw him alone. I resolved my mononucleosis. Uh, Turned out I lost 11 pounds in the process. And he, of course, he made a comment about that. Uh, but then when I told him that I was, you know, had interest in being a doctor, uh, it was almost, he had to hold the laughter back. Uh, and, and he did say, not looking like this. Oh, wow. And so that, wow. that, that was, that, you know, that, that was, that was the aha moment. You know, it was kind of like, at that, it's kind of like, you know, for someone who's 17 bullied and, abused and so on and so forth amongst high school, you know, your, your high school classmates. Because you were overweight like a lot? Overweight? Yeah, I had like the foot, I had like the, the linebacker from the football team used to, you know, bully me in the locker room. I mean, I, I was, I was definitely, you know, as Rodney Dangerfield would say, no respect. Uh-huh. Uh, but I enjoy going to high school reunions, believe me. Yes, because you can show them. But, you know, that's so amazing because... I think a lot of people have had, you know, a similar experience where they were shamed or embarrassed or, you know, and, and your mother, I mean, as if it were her fault that she had made you that way. It's so amazing that fate, you know, the way things would turn out that you've now become an expert in this. So let's start there, actually. Let's talk about weight. Uh, so many people are gaining weight, and we now know that the microbiome, the gut, the inner ecosystem is playing a major role. Could you just explain that? Well, it's an interesting segue from an Italian mother who fed me pasta and didn't know that she was doing something wrong. I don't think it was about the amount. I just think that, you know, the things that were being fed that we know better now um, than we did 30 years ago or 40 years ago with what they were, we, um, is interesting is that in the very unrefined, uh, very fine form, is as good as give you know taken in glue, in some respects. Um, but it's highly glycemic, it's inflammatory, and the unfortunate part about wheat, as is for gluten, is that according to Alessio Fasano's work, is that really that gluten itself may actually begin the dysregulation of tight junction proteins, and the dysregulation of a gatekeeper protein called zonulin one, that may be an initiating factor and at least in his work, autoimmune diseases. But in fact, that can also uh, breach barrier function, which can allow bacterial toxins to disseminate and cause inflammatory responses, which really is the beginnings of, you know, diabetes and uh, obesity, so on and so forth. So gluten in and of itself um, may help breach permeability, which plays a role in these, these chronic diseases. Today, we're talking about weight regulation and and diabetes and blood sugar control and all that, but, you know, gluten can actually be 
um, something that can interfere with one's best uh, efforts to improve health and uh, control weight. Do you think if someone is, um, and by the way, I want you to know my father was Italian, so we had a lot of pasta, and then I was raised in the South, so we had a lot of fried chicken and lots of grease in our food, so I had terrible diet to start off with, but I totally understand where you're, where you're coming. Um, I was um, also overweight, about 25 pounds overweight too, and then when I went off to college, I was on my own with food, and I quickly lost that. And over the years, I found out I really have a completely different body than I thought I had growing up because, you know, now, now I have my real body. Um, but so, you know, like just, just a question about gluten is if somebody is eating, do you think people should take 100% off of gluten? Because, um, you know, some people are now saying, well, a little bit in moderation. But I've also wondered if you have a healthy interaco system and you're eating fermented foods with that gluten, because you and I wouldn't have been back then. We would have had our pasta without any fermented vegetables with it, for example. Do you think that makes a difference? Because there's bacteria in the fermented vegetables that are going to gobble up the uh, flour and the gluten and, you know, help break it down better, maybe? Here's the thing. Um, I think that um, gluten for someone with established autoimmune disease, to come off of that's a no-brainer. Uh, I know Amy Myers is really promoting that uh, in, in her protocols um, for autoimmune disease with great success. Um, gluten for, I think, people who have a strong family history, which puts them at risk for autoimmune disease, should come off. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of proponents of just coming off gluten-free, period, um, so on and so forth. I mean, you have paleo, you know, the paleo camp who believes that um, as well. You know, it, it's very interesting. It's, I think there is some individuality to this. I'm not – we can talk about GMOs and glyphosate, glyphosate as well. Um, but that, I think that plays a role as well. I mean, we talk about gluten itself as a protein, but look at our food. Maybe it's not so much, the, you know, gluten being the evil, but look how much gluten's now in our wheat. And look at the fact that we have glycosate as part of the cocktail, and that in and of itself appears to cause uh, gut microbial dysbiosis and is a carcinogen. So I think it's really, it's what we've done to our food. You know, we can focus on gluten. We can blame it all on gliden, but I think it's beyond that quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And flour products are just, which is what most people are eating in as bread or pancake or cereal. It's just not good for the gut. So I I a hundred percent agree. Actually the body called you diet, which is over 20 years old now from the very start was gluten-free, casein-free and sugar-free because I was going at that time after, um, you know, candidiasis. And I found that this is what people responded to. Now, one of the things you said in the book that I like, just like the way it was stated, you said, our relationship with this ecosystem is symbiotic. We house our flora and provide them with food. In turn, these organisms serve us in a number of ways, like they break down complex carbohydrates. They produce vitamins and nutrients. They produce short-chain fatty acids. They protect against pathogens. They help train the immune system. They support detoxification. They modulate the nervous system. Can we take some of those, like the short-chain fatty acids? A lot of people have no idea what they are, why they're important, why, why, and they're and the fact that the bacteria in there producing the short-chain fatty acids. Can we talk about that? Yeah, sure. The, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that the short-chain fatty acids, uh, propionate, butyrate, acetate, um, these are very, like, you know, as the name says, short-chain fatty acids that are essential for colonic integrity, colonic health. Um, at the end of the day, they're actually biochemically converted into acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA, as we all learned from the Krebs cycle, which we all hated, trying to memorize in college and so on and so forth and in high school, is that acetyl-CoA is, is before energy. I mean, basically, it becomes energy. So we need these um, valuable byproducts of fermentation to really maintain the energy of the lining of the colon. Thus, when we do not have enough of our prebiotic foods that are fermentable and the byproducts being these really essential short-chain fatty acids, our colonic health begins to suffer. They also prevent neoplasia. They're also anti-inflammatory. They regulate the tight junction proteins in the lining of the gut, uh, of the colon in particular. 
And believe it or not, the short-chain fatty acids regulate motility and ultimately appetite by, by the gut hormone production. They, they, they interact with what they call GP4143 receptors. And these receptors then really regulate like peptide YY and, and other um, gut hormones. And these gut hormones regulate appetite. So believe it or not, one of the ways that if you have really good whole foods that are high in fermentable, you know, um, let's say fibers, and these fermentable fibers get into short-chain fatty acids, that's going to get back into your brain and say, you know what, I've had enough. I'm full, right? So I think, you know, what we're looking at is that they sound like, oh, short-chain fatty acids, this guy from Hopkins, he's talking esoteric, you know, kind of turns me off. But no, kind of like you need to know this because there's great science to back it up. I mean, you need to have, you know, you talk about body ecology, you got to have, you know, a mix of both the good gut microbes and the fertilizing flora uh, in fermentable fibers, a lot of F's there. But at the end of the day, that's going to make you thrive. And the fermentable fibers are why you need plant foods in your diet, right? Yes, I, and, I, I completely agree. Yeah, and so the bacteria are actually taking those fibers in, all the plant foods you're eating, um, and some of them yeah, more so than others, um, they're taking those, uh, the fiber and turning it into the short-chain fatty acids that give you all that give you energy and that protection. And also I just wanted to yeah. kind of re sort of summarize that for people uh, because, you know, when people see terms like short chain fatty acids, sometimes they tune out, but the practical, you know, answer here is eat vegetables <laughs> because the bacteria love vegetables. Well, what else the, do the bacteria like? You know, here's, here's, Here's the point I'm going to make about the short chain fatty acids, just you know, just to kind of build upon our conversation, is that they can become so therapeutic that if you have colitis, and I'm talking about not like irritable bowel colitis, but if you have ulcerative colitis, and that colitis does not respond to medication, right? People mm. can be rescued just by giving short chain fatty acid enemas. Wow. That's how therapeutic. That's how critical. That's how relevant, that's how important that these short-chain fatty acids are to your colonic health, that if you won't fail steroid medications and so on and so forth, and I have done it and there's reports and there's actually controlled trials on this, is that you can be rescued uh, from surgery by these short-chain fatty acid enemas. I mean, that to me is very illustrative of how important that is to your physiology and, and your health. So it's really important to know that. And Yes, the vegetables, the soluble fibers in the vegetables and the fruits, um, these get converted to the short-chain fatty acids, and these are measurable. Um, there's a lot of functional medicine-type testing laboratories that can actually measure your short-chain fatty acid levels and see if they are sufficient or insufficient. And through food as medicine, you can encourage yourself to you know, take in your vegetables um, and, and your soluble fibers better to get these fermentable foods in your body. And sometimes for people, it's not enough bifidobacteria that converts, that ferments these good vegetables. And sometimes it's a matter of diet or a combination of the two, or that you have bacterial dysbiosis or an imbalance. So these are all, you know, these are all good discussion points, but at the end of the day, your body ecology runs your body, period. Well, naturally, I have to ask this next question because I'm sure everyone now is wondering what is a short-chain fatty acid enema? How do you do one? Uh, a, I would say with, um, you know, supervision. I mean, it's got to be prescribed mm. by a doctor. It's a compound, compounding pharmacist would put that together. And they don't smell nice. Um, they they kind of smell like, they smell kind of fishy, even though they don't have fish oil. But uh, they work. I mean, you know, they, they would come in a little bottle, just like any enema, and you would kind of give them yourself or whatever. Um, but they are, you know, they, they are prescribed. Wow, that's fantastic. I, I've never heard of, of that, and I'm sure most people listening have never heard of it either. So it's good to know because it's just another therapy that you can use. Then you use the term fermentable. Now, I think this is a term people are really confused about. First of all, they're fermented foods, fermented vegetables, for example, and 
fermented liquids like kombucha. But um, then, you know, we always say that the bacteria, particularly the pathogenic bacteria, ferment the food we're eating. Um, and and right. I think people get real confused. Like they think, you know, I've, I've had people really confused about the fact that fermentation in the gut, is that a good thing? Uh, can we talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, fermentation is an interesting process, but I think the way to think about it, it's a transformative process in that we're taking, uh, we're really breaking down biochemically the composition of these very, um, these poly, polysaccharides that are, you know, in long chains and trying to make them more digestible. And the, the bacteria really, by and large, have those enzymes. I mean, certainly there's tribes in Africa that are able to really ferment fibers that, you know, the rest of the world can't because they've, from a genetic evolutionary point of view, they've cultivated those enzymes, but these are bacterial enzymes that break down um, these plant-derived, let's say, um, you know, polysaccharides into much simpler uh, forms that we can then break down into ultimately these uh, short-chain fatty acids. So I think that's really the way to think about fermentation. People get kind of put off because mm-hmm. they think that they're going to make like the auto brewery syndrome. They think they're going to make alcohol and mm-hmm. they get sick from that. But, you know, fermentation is a healthy process. Fermented foods, like pickles, who would think pickles have more bacteria than sauerkraut, but they do or they can. Um, but the fermented foods that we've kind of shied away from, unfortunately, for many years, or if there is fermented foods, they're so adulterated that they're mm-hmm. mitigated or useless. Um, but in any event, um, you know, these fermented foods are putting back that healthy bacteria and the, the plants themselves, which form the foundation, like the pickles, are, are uh, prebiotic. So it's, I think these are very healthy ways to approach our diet, and we're not accustomed to it because we're, you know, we're used to McDonald's and we're used to pizza and we're used to, you know, all these other quote unquote ingestibles, which are called food. And we're really, 75% of our food is really not feeding our biome. I think it was uh, Sig Benchmark, and one of his articles had uh, made that quote that the vast majority of our food is irrelevant for our microbiome. In fact, it's hurting our microbiome. In the book, you go into three different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, but reboot, right. rebalance, renew. Let's take phase one because that's where everybody needs to start in that fixing the gut and you know, fixing these decades of eating the wrong way. What, what do you mean by reboot? Uh, what do you suggest to do in the reboot stage? Is it something anybody can do? You know, it's interesting. The um, the, the the three phases were uh, philosophically derived from the old four R. You know, the uh, remove being the first thing to do when you're, you know, it's kind of like when you want to stop the bleeding. You kind of, you know, when you want to stop the bleeding, you put your finger on the site and you kind of apply pressure and 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 you're trying to just, you know, halt the process. That's pathologic. So. We all recognize that, you know, we're trying to reverse gut dysbiosis. You have to stop feeding your body junk, which is fostering the dysbiosis. So the first really phase is really rebooting, like you do to your computer at times, to kind of reset your metabolism by limiting the amount of junk that your your, uh, gut is getting. And that's the gluten you and I were discussing a while ago, Mm -hmm. Um, inflammatory fats like corn oils and limit the red meat. And what, you know, phase one turns out to be is really like a a modified paleo Mediterranean type diet that's high in protein, lower in carbs, but they're good carbs, right? They're, they're plants, they're, they're rich in soluble fibers, but also limits the foods that people really have bloating with and foster the small bowel bacterial overgrowth that I know you want to discuss in detail, Mm -hmm. but we want to take out those foods so people feel better. They're limiting the junk. Their body's got a chance to heal, certainly because you're not feeding yourself those inflammatory glutinous um, foods. And that's where you start to see a shift. People, the first thing they feel better is they feel like they have energy. That is the very first thing I see people have is energy. 
um, before they even start losing the weight is that like a switch goes on. And it makes sense because if you're starting to limit inflammation, you don't have mitochondrial oxidation, the first thing they're going to feel is their mitochondria are starting to function again. And once the mitochondria start to function, you're going to burn fat more efficiently. So really, the phase one was because it's really had a heavy functional medicine influence. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it works. The paleo people can take credit for it. The Atkins people can take, you know, everybody can get in there and say, that's me, that's me, that's me, the Mediterranean people. But it's really functional medicine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we have a principle in body ecology. It's called step by step. And I've said to people that, you know, where do you start? You have to start somewhere. First and foremost, create energy. So you just gave the answer to how to do that. Fix the gut, and you'll start to have that energy. The other things are correct the, um, conquer the infections in your body, like if you have candidiasis, bringing that under control. Right. Um, correct, right. correct digestion, of course, is what, what we're doing from the very beginning, and, um, and then cleansing out the toxins. So we're, we're, in body ecology, we're focusing on all four of those. I love how you explain that in the book because it's just so beautifully explained. <laughs> and I think people need to hear things over and over, read them over and over until they until they really sink in and you start practicing them in your life. Now, now so in phase one, you're saying eating, eat more protein, but you don't go for red meat. What, what proteins would you recommend? You know, it's funny. I mean, I'm going to do is before I talk about what I recommend, I'm going to kind of jump on the fact that we're going to talk, we're going to talk about red meat for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and why? There, there's a couple of lines with that that, that still always kind of come back to the biome, the microbiome. One is that we talked about limiting like saturated pro-inflammatory fats, so on and so forth, and the red meat certainly has a lot of linkages to a lot of diseases. And I mean, I'll, I'll grant it that if uh, I'd rather have buffalo meat than, uh, than steak, unless it's really like grass-fed, organic, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. I think you know, the people in the paleo mindset have the right idea, like game meat, like meats that are going to be more wild and grass-fed and not toxic, but the reason that I really take red meat and I kind of take it out of phase one um, is that red meat is loaded with antibiotics. And so what's happening, you know, you follow Marty Blazer's book, Missing Microbes, is that his work, when when they did experiments at NYU, you know, Dr. Cho, the PhD, who, you know, runs his lab, is that they gave laboratory animals that were lean the amount of antibiotics found in conventional red meat that people in this country would consume on the average two to three times a week, and in those minute amounts that you find in the red meat, it's enough to make a laboratory animal fat on, on a kilogram per kilogram basis to us. So it's not like we're overwhelming these animals with antibiotics. We're not just picking on them because they're tiny, but on a weight basis, we're giving them those tiny amounts, and it's enough to make them fat. So the red meat, uh, one thing, there's a lot of health concerns with red meat, the linkages with cancer and diabetes and so on and so forth, but it's the antibiotics, and, and that you cannot you know, ignore the news and not know we got a big problem with antibiotics in this country, executive action, superbugs. You know, we're all focused on kind of the wrong thing. The, the real reason is that they're making us sick. But would you say then that if the person can get real high quality grass fed with just higher in omega threes and uh, I I love bison myself too buffalo it's, yeah. to me it's more flavorful and um, I, it's more tender at least the ones I get and so uh, if you know when I need it when when I, I can tell my body needs that steak that bison steak uh, but I know it's from a really high quality I mean it doesn't have antibiotics in it so you're saying it would be you're okay with people eating it in the beginning if they can get that quality or no do you think they shouldn't even have it in the beginning just like tom Moltaire, who has his book the elimination diet from him i learned that they're finding a lot of people can't do beef at all right now and it seems to be related to having lyme disease so that would be he would say no no in the beginning of an elimination diet i take it out only because um People kind of fall into line when they get into restrictions. Vegetarians don't have a problem with that, obviously. Um, they have problems with uh, protein sources. So when they go to eggs, you know, I say, well, you got to then go with your eggs. If you're going to be really strict on a vegan diet, you're not going to do fish and at least do eggs. And there's some dairy you can tolerate. You know, we'll talk about FODMAPs and fermentable, you know, dairy. There's some dairy that is well tolerated by people, um, mm-hmm. even in a restriction diet, but, you know, not, not all dairy. 
So, so I mean, you got to be able to have it a protein, right? But you, but 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 in terms of the, the red meats, I mean, if you can go to a store, you can get bison, and you feel good on it. I'm okay. But you know, when you design a program, you know, it's easy to tell somebody you got to really be careful with red meat. I think that's I rather err on that side and tell them in phase two, yeah, go ahead and you know, grass-fed red meat and bison and, you know, all things we're talking about is fine because people tend to lump rather than split. And then if you're kind of splitting dairy, you're splitting this, you're splitting it, people are going to get very confused. Hmm. Well, so there's phase one and there's phase two, and the diet changes for each one of them, right? I mean, phase one is more strict, and then you go to phase two where you can branch out. Right. Can you explain the difference between the two? Well, here's the thing. You talked about rebuilding the gut in phases. That's, that's kind of like for people in, in our field. We appreciate the complexity of that and not one diet fits all or one phase is the same. Mm-hmm. You got to first really start to kind of shift and cultivate and weed out um, the dysbiotic, let's say, bugs by cutting their supply off. And then at that point, you start giving back, um, like planting a garden. Just think about the, you know, it's springtime, it's March, at least out here out east, and you start to get out the rake. And then all of a sudden you put the fertilizer down. Then you start casting the seeds, and that's when your garden's going to grow. Because if you start taking seeds, you go to the, the vacant lot in the city, and you throw seeds, you can expect it to grow. It's not going to happen. you got to cultivate the soil. So phase two is about cultivating the soil with fertilizer or fertilizing foods that are prebiotic, along with giving back that good bacteria that's going to help your physiology. That's what phase two is all about. Mm. And you mentioned the FODMAP diet too. I know you're a big fan of FODMAP. Could you explain what that is? Because I know that has to do with sugars in the gut. So in, so in phase one, as part of kind of limiting foods that are uh, symptom driving and or, yeah, symptom driving would be the way to put it. So let's say fructose laden foods, you know, honey is, but so are a lot of the junk we eat have a lot of fructose that can cause problems like, like sodas and, you know, and then there's foods that are really very gas and you know, very gas producing like broccoli that even though it's healthy, probably when you're having a lot of bloating and gas is not the right time to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, lactose is a FODMAP, but there are very low lactose dairy products. You know, there's cheeses that people can eat that are high in protein. So the low FODMAP diet was really um, put together by Sue Shepard and Peter Gibson out in Australia Mm -hmm. and the group at Monash. And now it's obviously caught on uh, out here in the States. And what it does is for people with irritable bowel and small bowel overgrowth, it really brings down the burden of fermentable foods that are hyperosmotic to the gut and the people's IBS symptoms get so much better and the SIBO gets under control quickly when they go on a low FODMAP diet. Now, the majority of people with overweight and obesity have gut dysbiosis and SIBO. So when I'm putting the diet together, I'm saying, what is a better way to approach this then incorporate a low FODMAP approach to get really the dysbiosis under control. So just can you name what FODMAP, I mean, say what FODMAP stands for, because it's the F-O-D, they, it means something, just so people have that in their mind. Oh, I apologize. These, these highly fermentable foods are called fructo, oligo, di, monosaccharides, and polyols. That's how they got the FOD and the MAPs. And these are all, I mean, my, my, it's like hundreds of foods that qualify as being higher in FODMAP content. In Australia, what Susan and the Monash group did was they actually measured the FODMAPs because I was going to do that in the States for them. Uh-huh. So I was looking at equipment here at Hopkins. And, you know, before everybody got busy, I mean, we were actually looking at, you know, spectrophotometers. And there's ways to do it. There's ways to measure these FODMAPs in a laboratory. And for all their studies in Monash, they did it. They did it. So, it, it, so, it, so it's actually something that's measurable. Um, and it's, as you know, it's well-published. There's a lot mm-hmm. of FODMAP experts in this country, and there's a lot of data online. Some of it's conflicting. But the bottom line is, is that uh, you know, there's a lot of information available on FODMAPs, and certainly in the book I outline the major ones mm-hmm. to avoid, right? I mean, honey is like honey, fructose-rich Processed foods and even like pears and apples are a lot of fructose. They may want to just limit like the major FODMAPs and keep them under control. Well, I was thrilled to see that, um, that you put that, the FODMAP in the book because 
it works. When someone's gut is really messed up and they've got a pathogen like SIBO, it works. I even had that personal experience myself. I, I, I went on a lot of back-to-back -back trips and I wasn't able to eat well, um, my diet, and couldn't eat the protective fermented foods. And I'm not sure exactly what happened to me, but I'm guessing I got a, a touch of food poisoning. And in, within a week or so, I noticed that I couldn't even eat fermented foods, which I, uh, you know, drink things I always drink. And I thought, wow, what's going on with me? And then I thought, you know, I think I have all the symptoms of SIBO. So, of course, knowing what to do, I started implementing that. But I followed the FODMAP diet. I eliminated those foods that were, you know, that FODMAP says to eliminate. And it worked. And um, I've, I've, I mean, I knew it worked. I knew, I knew it worked for a couple of years. But, I, you know, I, I think um, that's one of the things I love about your work, too, because I attended a conference uh, on SIBO, and you were one of the key, you know, teachers of the, mm -hmm. at the conference. Um, let's talk about SIBO a little bit because it's so much more common today than ever. Like, what do you think are, what, why, what, what's the cause? Why do so many people have SIBO? Uh, let's say what it is, small I, I, intestinal I, bacterial overgrowth. I should ex explain that first. <laughs> okay. Right. So I was having a conversation uh, with a nice lady who's a professor up in New York and She's frustrated because her daughter is about to go to Harvard, who's like one of these gifted people with scholarships, mm. but she's having problems resolving her SIBO. And so she had, so I had given her advice, um, you know, to see some of the people that really ran that conference that you just went to. Uh -huh. And she reached out for me for obvious reasons. You know, I have a paper out on this and knowing the field, so on and so forth. So. The reason why I bring that particular conversation I had just a little while ago up was that when you when you look at SIBO, um, when you look at gut dysbiosis, when you have SIBO or just with thought about as having an overcolonization of the small bowel with microbes, particularly anaerobes, um, that's a sign that the gut is off in terms of its ecology. So it's more than just that you have an overcolonization or a shift in terms of placement. To me, there's like a disruption, and that is one sign and one measurable sign by breath testing that you have gut dysbiosis, um, and then you got to kind of look at the person as a whole and looking in at their gut saying, what is really going on here that got them to this place? So for some people, it has taken the dreaded proton pump inhibitors that blocks the stomach acid that, you know, that the nature um, has for a reason and that is to really make us sterile in that area because our gut should be sterile, and when they're not sterile, we do not do well. So stomach acid being blocked by, you know, mankind and or pharmaceuticals, um, it's unfortunate, it's, it's excessive, and uh, un unfortunately, it's the third most common selling class of drugs in the U.S. since 2001, um, or 2000 actually. So there's a lot of it out there, and I think it's contributing to a lot of dysbiosis. Um, but in any event, you got to look and see if that's being done. And a lot of people who I see with SIBO have it, and there's meta-analyses meta -analyses linking ingestion of PPIs to SIBO. So that's mm. got to be thought of. Is there gastroparesis? In other words, are the motility mechanisms that are in place to sweep out the bacteria and keeping that sterile, that, that, that broom effect? If that's not mm -hmm. place, You're talking that's... about the migrating motor complex. You know, a lot of people yeah. don't know that we have this little sweeping broom. Can you talk about that for a second, too? Yeah, basically, that's most active at night. Um, that's when the cycles become longer and stronger, is that we have uh, neurologically activation of this migrating motor complex that sweeps out um, debris and microbes. And it's kind of like when a the umpire gets out and he dusts off home plate. That's what's, what, that's what's happening, um, particularly at evening, but it happens in between foods. That's what they call the interdigestive food cycle. And if you ate nonstop 24 hours, even though the calories are not the different, um, you're doing yourself harm because you need to have an, a period of rest and also of clean out to keep that all free of bacteria. Okay. And so the so grazer, the person that's grazing all day, not eating a real meal, uh, but kind of grazing, they're in trouble. Not smart. Uh, not uh, if, unless you unless they have to. Oh. You know, for blood sugar control, oh, yeah. if they got an NG tube down, and that's they got to have continuous feeds. So, so you know, when necessary, 
yes, but you know, otherwise, maybe not the best way to go. Your body needs a break. Mm-hmm. Um, but what people are doing to get unhealthy and overweight is that the typical, I don't eat till I get home. I starve myself during the day. I get home six o'clock at night. I have a big meal. What do you think is going to happen? You know, and then they gain weight. And the calories in that one meal is less than the person who has three squares, right? And they can't understand why they're gaining weight. Why? Because what's happening? They're fostering gut dysbiosis because they're not really having that rest at night. They're having food in their gut when they are sleeping. And that interdigestive phase is not working because they're interfering with the peak activity time, their circadian rhythm of that. So they're going to develop small bowel overgrowth. They'll have gut dysbiosis and they will extract and absorb more energy out of that food because of their lifestyle habit than the person who had three squares. So that leads to SIBO and it leads to being overweight because they're fostering gut dysbiosis. If your pancreas fails, right, there's an enzyme you can measure in a stool, pancreatic elastase. If that is insufficient, that will contribute to small bowel overgrowth. If you've got you know, this motility up and down your gut, which a lot of people do. They have constipation. They have slow gut transit. That'll contribute to it. And finally, um, I don't know, when I first started getting into functional medicine, maybe 20 years ago, a good buddy of mine who's deceased, um, who you may have heard of, Bill Timmons, who's like, who was like the classic naturopath who really mapped out the stress response and how to deal with it from a, a nutraceutical point of view. He was very well known, opened up a laboratory um, which his son still runs um, to this day that does a lot of the adrenal stress testing. But in any event, Bill got into this open ileocecal valve that um, that a lot of the docs, the, the chiropractors and visceral manipulation specialists and the naturopaths really, you know, from a, a traditional point of view discussed. But then, you know, I five years ago, there was a technology called a smart pill, which measure ileocecal valve pressures non-invasively. And so uh, John Clark and I from Hopkins went to the smart pill you know, they had a meeting in Chicago when we started talking about doing those pressure measurements. We all got busy. And then a doctor, Bonnie Rowan, came along at a fellowship from Yale, and she loved Smart Pill. And I said, well, we got the project for you. And then we've written two papers showing that a lot of people who don't respond to SIBO, it's because they have an open ileocecal valve or a low ileocecal valve pressure, which predicts the, the, the prevalence of, of SIBO. So that is a great connection to discuss because that is not really on the forefront of people's minds when they look at mechanisms. Well, what causes the um, ileocecal valve to remain open and let this bacteria come up, you know, into the small intestine where it's not supposed to be? And what, how do you close it? I mean, can a person close it themselves? Is it something their doctor has? Here's, here's two issues with that. One, um, and I'm not a naturopath or a chiropractor or a visual manipulation specialist, so I really can't comment with much detail on either question. I mean, that you ask in terms of cause and, and certainly therapy, um, what really can irritate a valve is in, in, in their disciplines are, are very multifactorial, but are related to triggers for dysbiosis. In other words, bad diet um, is what I'm hearing from, from my colleagues. How to fix it. It's really more, and uh, in my textbook, Integrative Gastroenterology, I believe it's Gail Wexler, who wrote the chapter for Jean-Pierre Burrell from the Burrell Institute, is that people can use visual manipulation, but again, that's physical. But if there are other triggers to IC valve dysfunction, then, you know, they will only be, uh, you know, short term, right? So I don't know what the answers are for that, um, but I know that there is a scientific, two scientific papers showing low ileocecal valve pressure to SIBO, and that's just, it's, it, it's intuitive, but the fact that we have a non-invasive way to look at it, um, and thankfully it's, it's, it's peer-reviewed in, in, in one of the top, in two of the top GI journals, um, I, think, I think you'll see a lot of other people kind of pursue that over time and hopefully come up with some uh, solutions. But the smart pill that you're talking about, can anybody get that test done? Do they have to go to a specialist, or how, how, how would that's- someone get that test done? Well, yeah, I mean, it kind of plays off the conversation I had uh, earlier today um, is that we, we've been doing it here, but, you know, the, the payouts from that, given technology bought out the smart pill company, so given now took it over, and they're like the capsule experts. And so the problem has been insurance, like anything else. So Medicare will pay, um, I believe, Blue Cross, 
no, you, some Blue Cross, there's like 70 different types of Blue Cross, but certain Blue Cross plans in United. But, you know, we, we've, we've had to take a stop here and take a look and see where we stand with all that because what is said and what's done are two different things with payouts. But, yeah, I mean, if you go to a certain – there are centers that do it, and people can pay out of pocket to have it done. It's very expensive out of pocket. It's like 2500 bucks or so. Insurance can cover it, but just from a technological point of view – um, it can measure that. So I, I think that's really make it, helping us understand pathophysiology while we're frustrated by availability. Um, I think there being, certainly we didn't have this five years ago, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, I know, you know, colon therapists, for example, often check the ileocecal valve and we'll close it up for people. But you're basically saying that if you've got a bad diet, it's just going to open right back up again. I mean, that's what your colleagues are feeling uh, might be the number one cause of the ileocecal valve malfunctioning. Did I, I just to make sure that's I understood that right? That's what my colleague, that, that's what, you know, it, the natural, that's what I'm told. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. this is really, this is, yeah. I mean, I could talk more, more uh, substantially about baseball than about that, but, mm -hmm. but it's just, okay. it's, out of, it's out of my wheelhouse. I mean, this is like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I need the enlightenment as well on that area, but I just know because of the, it's a no-brainer to lie to put the two together. I mean, natural next steps would be to look at, you know, treatment of the valve, however that be, mm -hmm. and look at outcome. Because maybe that's one reason why it's like a merry-go-round with people. They got antibiotic after antibiotic, and they don't get better. Mm -hmm. it, it's a wheel of misfortune. Well, that's the hard thing about, say, I'm saying SIBO. I've been saying that for a couple of years. I'm, am I saying, the, is it SIBO or SIBO? It's both. I mean, I've heard it both ways, quite honestly. So you're either way, you're right. It's it's uh, SIBO, SIBO. It's kind of like stevia thing. and stevia. If you know, people have different ways to pronounce it. So so, so SIBO, is it? Um, I mean, I was going to say. Hold on a second. I forgot my question. Okay. okay, so SIBO, it's really difficult for people to get rid of it, and there's a constant. You know, everybody complains that they think they got rid of it, and then it comes back again. Do you? What do you think is the answer for that? That's, I don't really have an answer. Um, you know, one area that I want to bring up, though, is what I find, is that, if I can just deviate the topic a little bit, is that there's people who are very anxious to go back on probiotic supplements um, either during or after treatment of, of uh, SIBO. And as you probably heard during my lecture, I'm not a fan of that. I mean, I am all for building up the microbiome for gut immunity. Uh, and maybe Saccharomyces boulardii because it's not a bacterial form of probiotics that will build up secretory IgA and is very, you know, otherwise is not going to counteract people's measures to treat SIBO. But quite frankly, I see too much of people coming in the clinic. They're taking good doses of probiotics and they're feeling quite sick. Um, when they take the probiotics, this is beyond bloating. They're feeling mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they see they're like leaky classic leaky gut type of symptoms because they're dousing themselves with with microbes mm -hmm. in the setting of a very unhealthy gut. And that's not going to just because you're dumping more seeds on a vacant lot doesn't mean you're going to have a better garden. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you brought that up um, a good number of years ago, about ten years ago, when we were. Um, I've been working with autistic children for a long time, and. Um, you know, most of them just thrive in the fermented foods, but there'd always be that child or two whose mother would write in and say, you know, we, he can't eat the fermented vegetables, he can't drink the coconut kefir. Um, and, and, and then I started tr to try to understand why, and uh, it, I pretty much tracked it down um, to basically SIBO, <laughs> except that term wasn't very well talked about back then, so I didn't call it that. But I noticed that, that there were people that had a pathogen, a pathogen that was making them, it was almost like a diagnosis. If you are reacting that way to the fermented foods, it was like you could almost take it to the bank and say, okay, this person has a pathogen in their gut, they need to treat that. But the one, the bacteria that they could take was the bifidus, and like you said, the saccharomyces, so Bilardi, which is a yeast. Um, do you uh, kind of agree, I mean, is, was I right about that? I mean, are you, hold on, hold on, let me just rephrase that question. Um, so bas so basically what I'm I realized is that you know 
this was back 10 years ago, that fermented foods are right for people in the beginning. So they, in this case, with SIBO, you wouldn't have fermented vegetables. You wouldn't have fermented liquids and so on. Uh, just, so that's you agree with that, right? Or yep. disagree? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but are you saying that the one bacteria they would be able to have are the two? types of microbes yes, see, would be yeah, because it's really not a bacteria i mean that, that that's the beauty of it it's this very low dose you know uh harm not harmful uh helpful yeast mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. really helping reset the immune system which is dysfunctional in these people what about I mean, bifidus it, though well the problem with that um you know is that it's as much as it's constitutive it's still bacteria so if you're going to take 30 billion CFUs of bifidobacteria and mm-hmm. dump it in your small bowel, mm-hmm. um, I've seen intolerance to that. Mm, Help, okay. Helpful as it is, mm-hmm. you got to realize you got a leaky gut, right? And and you're dumping more microbes with their byproducts in an area that's compromised that doesn't tolerate too much bacteria. It's 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 like you know, I don't know. It's like stretching your leg when you got a hot disc in your back. Mm-hmm. And although you're, you're trying to help yourself by relaxing the muscles so the disc can go back, you know, into place, but you're still irritating your nerve root. So you just, you don't want to, you got a hot disc, you don't want to do too much to irritate your nerve root. And that's kind of like your, 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 your prime directive before you start fixing, you know, the underlying problem. And if you want to, my message to everybody is like, if you want to fix yourself from an ecological point of view, magic bullets and rushing it is not the way to go. Okay, so the uh, treatment is start with a, either an antibiotic or botanicals, and then not an ex- the only probiotic you might take is the Saccharomyces boulardii. Right. Then when would you start to, um, at what point do you feel a person could start to try to introduce some lactobacillus or bifid- more bifidus? Well, I think like in phase two, you know, that's why things are phased out. I mean, people are going to start feeling improved from a symptom point of view. They're going to feel like they're, 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 for me, weight loss, energy. I mean, these little things are starting to come into play. But you can't stay on this for life. I mean, if you were, you know, there's studies, there's two studies showing that if you're gluten-free, um, your bifidobacteria counts drop. So we know that, you know, that there is a long-term, unless you want to be paleo long-term or Atkins long-term or whatever it is that's keeping the weight down for you. I don't think it's the best way to go to do that because ultimately it's your microbiome that you want that to work for you, not that you have to intentionally restrict yourself and that's not an enjoyable way to live. But in any event, when you feel like you've either lost enough weight, feel great, then you start phasing in these prebiotic and probiotic foods uh, in phase two, which includes, you know, these, these foods will be rich in bifidobacteria. That's correct. Well, this has been a fantastic and extremely valuable interview. I thank you so much because I know how busy you are with launching the new book. I just want everybody out there to know that this book is a great book. It's endorsed by so many people that you would respect him, like J.J. Virgin, Andrew Weil, Christian Christian Northrup, um, Mark Hyman, David Perlmutter, Frank Lipman. These are people that are experts in their fields, and they love this book. So this is a book you really got to purchase and and read. Is it available on Kindle, too? I have. uh, First, I just want to also say that, believe it or not, it's endorsed by the Surgeon General, the 17th Surgeon General, Richard Carmona, who was back in, you know, the the, uh, back in the 90s, he was Surgeon General. But he called it a must read. Mm-hmm. I so would say that too. We talk, we talk about our friends, our friends in these inner circles who are really very respectable, but the U S surgeon general kind of adds another layer, which is great to that. And, and yeah, Kindle, Amazon, whatever, Indie, whatever, Barnes and Noble, whatever, you know, however you want it, it's available. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for writing it, and we would um, love to do more interviews. So, thank. I know you're extremely busy right now, but I wanted my yeah. group. That I knew it was. As soon as I saw that it was coming out, I thought this is a book that my audience needs to know about. So, thank you very much, Dr. Gerald Mullen. Can you give us the website to go to? Because you have a great website with tons of information on it. Quite simply, it's thefoodmd.com. And you really w- are that. www.thefoodmd.com. Just thefoodmd.com. And, and you are really a food 
doc. I mean, you've definitely got a huge focus on food. So thank you very, very much for your work. Well, so you look at it this way, Donna, like you, you were one of the pioneers. I mean, this is, must be very rewarding to you mm-hmm. to look now in an era where you have all these gut microbiome books and all this, all the research that's going on where, you know, 20 years ago, it was kind of like, you know, you you were really ahead of your time. I mean, it must be quite rewarding for you as well. It actually is. It, it It's like an explosion. Sometimes I wonder where to go next. I think, well, this is covered. Everybody is beginning to get it, how important this world is. But you know where I've been focused on is getting into nutritional genomics because I think the microbiome yeah. and nutritional genomics are going to be you know, what everybody focuses on for the next several decades. And, and people... You know, we, like, for example, in your book and in my book, we lay out the foods that are really ideal to eat the healthiest foods of all and explain why they're good, and particularly for the microbiome. But, again, there's that principle of uniqueness, and I know you believe that very much, too, that we still, you have to do what works for your unique body. And that's where nutritional genomics is going to help people tremendously, like, should you eat more fats if you've got the APOE4 gene? No, you should not. Even the best fats, you have to have very tiny amounts of them. So um, that's where I'm going, and that's where I've been focusing on lately. Well, thank you. And also metabolomics. Metabolomics is actually, you know, you got the biome. We're defining what's there. It's like, what are they doing? And how do they interact? How do they, it's, there's, there's a lot going on. It's like a whole symphony of, you know, metabolomics going on that really may even become more, you know, uh, awakening. So you're talking about looking at the bacteria because we have our genes and then they have their genes, right? And also the byproducts. In other mm. words, we're talking about, you, you know, the simplistic is the glutamate and all that. I mean, we're talking about what are they making mm-hmm. that's really, what, that's controlling all this. What are the products and how are they changing our genomics? So mm-hmm. you know, how are they inducing changes within us? We don't quite understand that, but I think that's part of the next revolution. Oh, I totally agree. Thank you for saying that. Actually, thank you for the whole interview. It's just been perfect in every way. Cool, cool. Same here. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much for listening today. If you are new to Body Ecology, please subscribe to Body Ecology Living with Donna Gates. Also, feel free to leave a comment anytime you want on Facebook. Be sure you purchase The Gut Balance Revolution by Gerald E. Mullen, MD, and go to his website. It's thefoodmd.com. Thank you.